Maths is back. Good evening, everybody. No, it is not Josh Parrish. It is not Nick Stoll. It's Joe Simon here. And this week, I am joined by Teo Pelletzeri. How are you, Teo? Mate, what a disgrace at the MCG on Saturday. Is this the beginning of the end for Sam Mitchell? Hawthorne, I mean, I know it's tough to play your arch rivals in round one, but it was a poor showing. Bad kicking is bad footy. We are here to break it all down. The Make Australian Football Fun podcast. Well, neither of us had fun this weekend. Mm. And uh, all the about, Essendon fans get stuffed. It's about time. The only good kicking from Hawthorne was Sicily's one-week suspension, unfortunately. But inaccuracy <laughs> cost the Hawks, didn't it? I mean, Mitchell's in trouble. Uh, um, by the way, this is Josh and Stoll's fault for leaving us to our own devices here, by the way. I, mean, I did now, try to find a few yeah. uh, surprise guests, but didn't have too much luck with the ringers. So it's you and me, mate. We're, it's just us two. Right, I feel like we're finally let free. And you know what? I've got a bit of a theory. So last week, you and I were unavailable. So Josh and Nick kind of steered the ship for us. An excellent podcast, it must be said. But I feel like this week, they've kind of gone, you know what? We've had our fun. Um, now you guys can, can do the hard work while we put our feet up. What do you think? Do you think they're kind of just leaving us in the lurch here a little bit? Uh, absolutely, given us that neither of us have hosted the show before. Uh, and my internet <laughs> decided to brick it as soon as we started running the intro. So clearly the uh, the bandwidth required to run the, the Family Guy imitation theme is devastating uh, to the old computer system here. But uh, no, we're having fun. And I guess the, the main question we ask every week, and we want to hear it from you in the comments as well. We have a heap of tweets to get to. And really, your questions are going to drive the show today, let's be honest. So make sure you get them in the YouTube comments as well. What made Australian football fun this week? Joe Simon, what made Australian uh, football fun this week for you? There, there was a lot going on this week. And it feels like over a week ago that the 7-0 Melbourne City Western United game happened. But that, that was so far, I've forgotten it. That's gone from my memory. But what I want to talk about is Brisbane MacArthur at Ballymore Stadium. Now, firstly, why were they playing at this stadium, Teo? Uh, because... They, I don't know, but uh, what I do know <laughs> is that half of the uh, half of the um, the stadium is unavailable. I mean, Brisbane's in a position here where, at the rate they're going, by twenty thirty two, the state of Queensland is actually going to need the Olympics to sports wash. I mean, we sit here and we laugh at Saudi Arabia and Qatar and all you know, Azerbaijan bids for every major event, Olympics, World's Fair, what have you. And here's Brisbane. Um, are we sure they didn't bid? for the Olympics because by 2032 they think that they will be some sort of hostile autocratic state that also needs an Olympics to sports wash their reputation. It it well could be. It well could be. What I loved about this game though, and the stadium as well was the food trucks behind the goal. It was absolutely captivating. There were a couple of free kicks towards towards that end that I was not watching. Oh, don't play. talk to me about I free was... kicks. The umpiring on Saturday, for goodness sake. Like, yeah, I know no. it's Essendon, and I know they need to start the season with a win, but, oh, my God, the umpiring was just a disgrace mm. as well. It absolutely was. It's going to hurt me losing Sicily this week against Melbourne. But what I loved about this game at Ballymore Stadium – the vans, the vans. I was calling it the dumpling van end because there was, a, I paused the game. There was dumpling master. There was a donut van. There was plenty on offer. And I love this for a stadium to have so much culture, so much choice in a stadium. But it was actually very distracting because I was looking at the man ordering the shy long bows rather than the free kicks coming in. I know you don't want to talk about it, but that was fun for me. I love seeing the array of food. And I know if, uh, if, Preston Lions own Josh Parrish was here. He'd be talking about the Preston market. Nick Stoll's talking about his tapas and having his reds in Spain. They'd be getting around this for sure. I think you know? the issue with that that stadium is a little bit like Redcliffe, which, by the way, if you've actually seen the highlights of the Dolphins against St. George in the, the Rugby League, gee, that stadium looks good when it's full. Shame the Raw never did that. Um <laughs> apparently it's in a bad part of town for public transport. I went there during the Women's World Cup. It's about a half an hour drive from the centre of Brisbane. I have no concept of sort of the residential breakdown of Brisbane or where the public transport network does and doesn't reach. Um, but, look, it's not a great stadium. It's got a running track. Apparently, yeah, one of the grandstands is condemned. And now the the hostile autocratic state of um, Queensland needs to use this venue uh, to sports wash its reputation because they're not going to be spending a cent on any new stadiums when they host the Olympics. Look, they might have a running track. The stands might be falling down, but you know what it does have? Pork buns and dumplings. And I think it's a good attraction for the A-League to go there. Now, Teo, you must tell me what made Australian football fun for you this week. 
Well, I, on Sunday afternoon, I was uh, commentating one of four concurrent games that all overlapped in the A-League women's. And uh, I thought that the match I was on was, was going to be a, a fairly, you know, maybe the, the fourth banana in terms of grabbing the headlines and the attention. And little did I know that uh, Canberra weren't planning on defending. They never are. No. And the Central Coast Mariners had some fantastic goal celebrations cooked up. Um there was been a lot of talk about the Matildas qualifying for the Olympics, but uh, apparently it's not in football. Apparently it's in rowing because mm. the Central Coast Mariners had eight different players uh, line up and row the boat. That's after that, that, by the way, that's only in the eighth minute of the game, Joe. They were two nil <laughs> up after eight minutes. And then the uh, shoe phone celebration was after half an hour. They were winning this game with such ease that they were able to just empty the clip on every celebration they had handy, uh, including the Quad Skulls team that uh, Sally Robin lay down Sally. Sally Robbins uh, yep. is going to have uh, 11 footballers now competing with her for a spot uh, in the Olympic Games in Paris. Now, I want to talk to you about this. So Central Coast won the game 4-0 in the end. And Canberra United, uh, four, four, bottom one, of the four. table. 4-1, pardon me. Canberra United, bottom of the table. They've won three games out of their 19 in total this year. Now, Central Coast clearly had... To be fair, Joe, nearly- to be fair... It- Listen to their fans. Um, mm-hmm. It's referees every week, so no, uh, it, it, they're shit out of luck because nineteen out of what seventeen out of twenty games this year, the referees have just had it in for them. But what can you right. do? That's football. Right, it is football. I saw the Hawthorne game on the weekend. They're absolutely <laughs> robbed. But I Central right Coast, cle- no. <laughs> Central Coast <laughs> clearly had these celebrations. They thought, you know what, we can feast here. We can really get them all out. Was it almost cruel? Did they see? Did they see prey here and then go, you know what, we're going to absolutely humiliate Canberra in this process? Well, I think the thing for Central Coast is they've been out of this league for fifteen odd years. Um, they, I think, had only played. They hadn't played uh, Canberra since 2009 and they beat them 3-0 in Canberra so they they were definitely had their measure and they're 2-0 up after 10 minutes here you know what it, i don't think it was disrespectful i think they were they basically lived the maths creed um mm-hmm. and i i would say congratulations to the mariners and they've set a pretty high bar for what comes next both in terms of how they're playing but also in terms of the celebrations because uh, now every time there's a goal, people are going to be wondering what comes next. I mean, there was even, amazingly, only bronze on the podium for the celebrations. The uh, the Chinese international, Ergamal, scored a goal in this mm. game and did a bunny hop celebration and then put on Instagram yeah. after the game. It was due to a gift she'd been given by one of her teammates, which was like this little uh, piece of rabbit jewellery. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's a good story, but it's not nine players rowing, mate. So, you know, lift your game, chop, chop. Absolutely. And you know what? It, they, the players kept you on, because you're commentating this game, of course. They kept you on your toes, because after the first one, you're a little bit confused. What's the what's the bunny hop? Is it Easter? Greek Easter is not till May. What's happening? <laughs> yeah, that didn't the even second... cross my mind, but yeah. <laughs> the second one, the rowboat, I loved it. You said they're rowing their way into the finals. Brilliant. Perfect. Well, I think it would have been, yeah. to be fair, it would have been better for Canberra, because they were well and truly up the creek without a paddle. Uh, in that situation. Yeah, were, so. yeah, it was the umpires, though. We can't forget the umpires' impact on this game. Um, firstly, thank you for getting your comments in. Simon on YouTube is saying, new coloured background, eh? That is because Tao and I don't know how to work this channel. We are not the usual hosts. We are trying our best. Nick Stoll, I sent my assistant coach to do the pod instead. Now, this is interesting. Tao, I was in Sydney over the weekend, and it was actually the first flight I had with Wi-Fi in flight. Game-changing. Nick Stoll is not on tonight because he's flying to Australia. Now, if he's in the comments, if he's on a plane, he's got Wi-Fi. And I say, Nick, it's not too late to tune in, mate. You can jump on any time you like. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I'm a little bit uh, sus about that with Stoll. Is he in a departure lounge or is he actually mm. um, is he actually in a position where he can come on? I think, it, look, I don't know if you saw the footage uh, of the flight to Bali that got turned around today. Uh, with the uh, slightly disgruntled customer that, that seemed to be making a bit of a scene. Um, I, look, I don't want Nick Stoll to be that person on his flight if it is in flight Wi-Fi. Mm, absolutely. Now, you mentioned the games that you were commentating over the weekend. One that you did was the uh, the soccer, uh, sorry, the Matildas versus South Korea. Laura, uh, Lara Gauchi, Gucci, pardon me. I'm calling her uh, Laura, Lara Gucci. She was the only scorer. There was 1-0. Unfamiliar territory, they were on grass this time instead of snow. But what I want to ask you, Teo, what is the music that plays after the goal? It wasn't the national anthem. Oh, no, no, that is the AFC anthem. So a bit like the Champions League, the AFC imitates 
everything and they have little knockoffs and yeah, you know, they have the walkout anthem. So where that UEFA was smart enough to steal Zidoc the priest uh, from the English royal family or whoever whoever mm. wrote it, we need Highbrow Parish here to tell us about our classical <laughs> music history. Um, uh, the AFC has its own anthem, uh, which is the walkout anthem. So similar to the FIFA, FIFA anthem whenever they walk out at games. And then they have an abridged version of that after every goal. So to bring it back to footy, and there's no one here to stop us, um, you know not. how the Gold Coast Suns, they play the every goal? That is literally the AFC equivalent of that. So for everyone who gets cultural cringe every time we break the no share and rule on this pod, just remember that the AFC literally does the same thing as the Gold Coast Suns at mm. their continental tournaments after every goal. It is a bit different, though, playing the competition anthem rather than the individual team. <laughs> now, if we're staying are on the saying, topic... Are you saying that Australia should have taken the Gold Coast themes, uh, the Gold Coast Suns fanfare and, and we play that after the goals we score? <laughs> it really is fanfare, isn't it? Oh, look, it's catchy, is all I'm saying. Now, one thing uh, the Brisbane Handel, Lions... By the way, Handel wrote Zidoc the Priest. There you go. Absolutely. Josh Parrish uh, also seems to have in-flight Wi-Fi from wherever he's listening from uh, and has just messaged me now. <laughs> he's always listening, Josh. We can always count on him. But the one thing the Brisbane Lions do well in the AFL, since we're on the topic, is they each player, when they kick a goal, they get to select <laughs> a song. And at the start of the year, the, the song sheet for each player is uh is leaked to the public i love this idea this is a brilliant idea i was wondering what do you think say bruno fornaroli he scores a goal he's scoring a lot of goals this year what do you reckon he's and this is off the top of your head what do you reckon he would like played over the loudspeakers you know i think if you're a melbourne victory player you know the captain of the dressing room has to actually you know how arsenal used to have the rule that if a player wore the captain wore short sleeves everyone wears mm. short sleeves and if the captain wears long sleeves everyone wears long sleeves i think the captain of melbourne victory has to pull everyone aside and say you are choosing seven nation army and nothing else and if you don't choose seven nation army you're off the team and that yeah, is what was, i would hope would happen in the melbourne victory dressing room it's a very it's a very obvious question isn't that one i think that's the <laughs> only one they played now i want to move on to wellington 2 Sydney FC won. Now, the big talking point of this game was really hotly contested. Redmayne wearing a cap. Now, it was sunny in Wellington. Um, he's SPF, at least at least 80, I would say, for Andy. There's something quite cleansing about seeing a goalkeeper. This, this day and age, you've got VAR, there's a lot of technology ruining the game. But when I see a keeper wearing a cap, I feel like everything's back to normal. I feel like home again. What do you think about it? I, I don't think we see it enough. I, I, I actually Absolutely. wonder... Does the kit man for each club think to bring a peaked cap, even if it's not necessarily the goalkeeper's mm. preference? Because I think that in our league, and I know a lot of the games have been kicking off a little bit later this year, um, not too many. I think uh, December, January, February, we didn't have a single game kick off before 5 p.m. But we do have a lot of games kicking off in setting sun. So I am actually surprised that we don't see this more often. And I actually think we should take it even further. Um and we should have even uh, sunglasses like Edgar Davids oh. as well. And the goalkeepers should be allowed to, you know, basically give themselves every opportunity. It's about comfort, though. I mean, some goalkeepers probably, you know, would get uh, thrown by the idea of having a hat on their heads. Whereas, I don't know if you you feel, you know, as though it's that big a deal. I would have thought mm. protecting your eyes from the sun is the number one priority. Absolutely. And I think in, in Wellington as well, in New Zealand, they've got some beautiful snowy mountains there. I think Paulson could bring off the big ski goggles. I think that'd be a good look as well. But we should talk about the game a little bit. Barbarousas, he's having an amazing season. Another goal, a brilliant assist on this one. It's 11 goals and four assists for the season. How well is he tracking this year? Is he top three for player of the year? What do you think? You're on the panel. And there's Ed Card Davids popping up on my screen. You can't tell me that Andrew Redmayne wouldn't be a better, better goalkeeper <laughs> in the sun. I know that those were medical glasses for his his vision issues, but imagine those just a little bit darker. I mean, it's almost like the uh, NFL receivers that have the uh, on their helmets. They have the shield over their eyes, so you can't see which direction they're looking before they run. Maybe that's the next thing that uh, you have glasses that actually hide where you're looking. So on penalty kicks, uh, you know the pen you can look to either side of the goal, and the goalkeeper can't read where you're eyeing off before you take your penalty. It could be a game changer. 
What about the Apple Vision Pros with each each player's penalty side listed on the in the inside of the glasses? It's that funny be because that, you know if I can really wind everyone up as if the no sharing rule violations weren't. Can you imagine if you had the uh, what is it the <laughs> Apple Apple iVision Pro? But it tells you where you are on the pitch and what your XG would be if you were to shoot, oh, and you actually absolutely. make your decision on whether to shoot or pass based on. And as soon as you get over 0.5 XG and you're you know, more likely to, to score than not, that's when you start shooting and, and decide against it. Hey, don't, don't laugh at it. You know, Elon Musk could become the uh, Pep Guardiola or the Jose Mourinho of the 2030s if he's able to develop the brain chip to the point where he can implant it in footballers. Mate, it's the future of goalkeeping headwear, that's for sure. Um, keep your comments coming in. There's plenty coming in. Run their memes on YouTube. So many violations. Yes, uh, there is. We don't make any apologies. We'll try to keep it minimal. Let's move it right along now. There was a big announcement this week. A new team has come into the league. Quite controversial. Some people didn't want them in. Some people did want them in. But I think the Tassie Devils is a good addition to the AFL, Tao. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people have kind of been <laughs> underwhelmed by the colours and also the just the map of Tassie with the T on it as the jersey. <laughs> I Disappointing. Think, yeah, no, 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 we tried different with the Suns and the Giants. Mm. And... I don't think either has resonated the way they might have hoped. Tassie is a traditional market and Nuffs love tradition. So why wouldn't you put them in red? I think they called, what did they say? They said it was rose. Uh, and I can't remember what they called the other color. The really weird it's thing was like, I have a, I know a couple of graphic designers from my, my time in uh, the media and the AFL put out the color scheme with the RGB and the CMYK color codes. Almost wow. as though to say, if you're going to make your own fan art and if you're going <laughs> to keep um, perpetuating what goes on with this team, here you go. We'll give you the color codes. You can draw them up in Photoshop yourself uh, and uh, we're more than happy for you to go and do it. So, yeah, a green, a yellow and a red. And all the replies have emojis of Senegal and Cameroon and even <laughs> Mali. So there you go. The influence of the strategy. world game, the influence of the world game is already, I think, a key pillar of the new Tassie team in the uh, in the AFL. I don't know the, the name was inevitable. They were always going to work out the copyright situation. Mm. I mean, do you think the state election and this has tangential relevance to the uh, to the A League and potentially to the National Second Division? But do you think the state election will scupper yeah. the stadium plans if uh, if the wrong uh, party gets in? Well, it's interesting that they've done the announcement now. So it's almost you want to hold off the announcement until you're absolutely positively sure, but that's not for a while. So they absolutely could. It could. There could be a giant backflip here. I also you thought do, that you this chat. Think, you don't think this was trying to subtly influence mm. the vote to say, because down in Tassie, they actually have like protesters, but they're like speaking enough, their actual, they're actual like catchphrase, because you know, Tasmania has a long and proud tradition of, um, protesting against various things most of them to do with the environment you know cutting down old growth old growth forests and things like that you know noble causes but um mm. the the catchphrase is stick your stadium up your bum that's literally what the anti-stadium protesters say down in tassie so jared waitley refers to it as the up your bum crew and this wow. is this is a big week for them because they need to rail against the team from tassie rail against the stadium and then they probably need to go and vote for a party they never would have voted for in the Liberal Party because most of these people historically would have been sticking up for green causes. Well, I think stick your stadium up your bun is a less intrusive jingle than I've got a hole in my budget. So you know what? I've heard worse. I've heard worse than that. I actually thought this was going to be a quick joke turnaround talk about Auckland, but I'm glad we're sticking to it. This is maths, my friend. This is maths. This is maths. It could go anywhere. Joseph on YouTube is saying, A-League 2022 uh, headlines, pitch invader bad. 2024 headline, pitch invader good. Now, this was interesting. For those who didn't see it, in the, uh, like the 83rd minute of the Wellington game, we saw a pitch invader. There he is there if you're watching us live. Come onto the pitch in Auckland's brand new kit. Now, firstly, we've got to talk about the kit for a second. So a little bit into Milan. It's a little bit, uh, is it the gold and white dress? I don't know. Which colours do you see here? Because I got, uh, it's more I black and blue for me. I definitely see black and blue. I definitely see black and blue. You see black and blue? It was. It's a little bit into Milan. It's just missing the Paramount Plus logo, of course, Dayo. Uh, well, uh, maybe that's a good sign for things going into the future. Yes. But let's talk about Auckland for a second. How did you? Yeah, that, that did get super awkward for a second there. <laughs> how did you think? How did you think the announcement? Ray Mysterio. Ray Mysterio. I know nothing about wrestling. So if we want to bring it back to AFL, we can. 
<laughs> do you think that this was a planned pitch invader? What do you think is this the publicity? 100% Talk me through yes. it. Um, ambush marketing is the best marketing. It's It's been mm. done, when it's done well, and there's actually a debate about whether it was ambush marketing or not. I think, that, you know, that is what, you know, creates organic buzz because you, there are plenty of curmudgeons and sticklers who are cynical enough to not understand, you know, that's how advertising works in this day and age. And I, I, you know, the thing is, I, I know he was smiling as he was being walked off, but he took, he must have played rugby as a kid because he took a big tackle. And yeah, it was like did. a back, it was like a back breaking small of his back tackle. And you could see his legs buckle. And I mean, he's maybe he's in shock there. And that's why he's smiling because he took a real pounding and the security guards clearly were not in on the prank if it was indeed ambush marketing. Yeah. And I think he even looks a little bit made up for the event. I mean, usually a pitch invader. You wouldn't see them with such immaculate hair and glowing skin like that, but he looks like he's he's modelling there. He knows that this photo is gonna go is gonna go global. Well, for what you're saying that uh, most pitch invaders are in a greater state of undress and, and perhaps a little bit more intoxicated uh, than yeah. our friend here. I don't want to make any grand assumptions, but yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. Hey, can speaking he, about, hang on, can he sue us in Australia if we defame him in New Zealand? He probably can, can't he? So we've got to be careful. He can, but I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying he looks quite nice. So I don't know what he's going to be complaining about. <laughs> um, so, all right. Now, just on the Auckland expansion. Now, this joke uh, is shamelessly uh, the one that I had with many of our New Zealand friends, and, and they do uh -huh. occasionally watch this show and even quote us in their mainstream media. So bravo, New Zealand, Australia, catch up. But um, I have played a save in Football Manager of the New Zealand League Pyramid. with all, After you? covid they totally rearranged their whole national league, so I now have a pretty good handle on how uh, the the tripartite league system works in New Zealand. Uh, and my immediate thought was, congratulations on your entry to the A League Men's Miramar Rangers. <laughs> I mean, a bit of a strange choice to bring in a, a second team from Wellington, I must admit. Uh, but Miramar. Uh, congratulations, you've been waiting 117 years for your shot at the big time. Wow. And uh, I'm sure you'll be fantastic members of the A-League men's. How did the Wellington team go in your football manager save, just by the way? Um, oh, look, so Phoenix and the New Zealand national team weren't amazing. Uh, I, I Like all football managers, I largely relied on free transfers from South America. Yeah, uh, and so I was able to win the Oceania Champions League uh, and the New Zealand League a couple of times. But um, in terms of uh, bank for my buck, yeah, maybe not the best uh, couple of months I've spent in my life. But uh, I went and did it, and at least I have now an intimate – whenever I see the you know the uh, junior club of a lot of Wellington Phoenix players, at least I know where they've come from. And I think the best suggestion yep. that I did see, and I don't know how we can put this tweet on the show or not, or if I can just attribute it to um, Geraldo, who is a, a regular listener to MAPS, but he said, when Christchurch come in, if they can play in the traditional Christchurch colours of red and black uh, against the Auckland team in blue and black, we can have mm. the Milan derby in New Zealand. Wow. And I think absolute genius. If anything, we need to ramp up the pressure on Christchurch to become the next New Zealand market to enter the league. Absolutely. Forget the uh, Milan Fashion Week. I think we've got the New Zealand derby that's pulling out all the stops there. Also, I hear Miramar's making a big play for Chris Wood. So, I mean, he scored on the weekend. He, he could, you know, he's a free agent. He's looking for a club. Um, another game you were commenting on this weekend, Teo, was Western United and Melbourne victory, which ended 2-2. Now, I want to know from a commentator like yourself, where does Garuccio rank on a commentator's dream for an equaliser, a winning goal? Because it rolls off the tongue and he did a magnificent job getting that one out. Well, I mean, it's it, it's any Italian name. But any name that ends in a vowel is pretty good for uh, uh, a goal, um, especially one like that. I mean... I suppose the the easy accusation uh, to make is that you know I'm biased with Melbourne hmm. Victory. Uh, I was a member of the club, uh, you know, as a teenager when they first uh, created the A League. Um, but you know, you, you've just got to be impartial and, and let the game take you where it takes you. And I think Melbourne Victory fans were all enjoying that they'd done it to Western United again, and now they're all cursing their their misfortune. You know, I think that uh, at uh, one nil down. They, they might have been thinking that Popper was one foot out the door to the Western Sydney Wanderers. Yep. Uh, by the end of the week, 
Um, not only is Popper, you know, pushing them up the table, but Marco Rodan has saved his job at the Wanderers. So mm. two fans that maybe want a change of coach uh, are both sticking with their guy for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And you think, like, the Izzo penalty save, that if that went another way and they don't, don't end up drawing the game, I mean, do you think there could have been differences there? Do you reckon it would have just been, I'm out? I mean, at this Who's point... At this point, I think that Wanderers were so, so ready f- to lose to Perth and, mm. you know, have a change of coach that I, I kind of feel sorry for them in that they, they have a coach that, that, you know, is treating his own fan base as the adversary, uh, a group of players that are doing it for each other and in spite of all the criticism from the outside, which, again, is primarily from their own fans, um, and they're playing a style of football that none of the fan base enjoys. And I feel for the Western Sydney Wanderers because now they go into the international break where they get to experience exactly the same thing exactly. with the soccer rules. They just can't escape. They just can't escape. They're getting it from all sides at the moment. Well, speaking of the soccer rules, the squad was announced. Now, Nisbet, the big name in here, what do you think of this move? What do you think of the ins, Teo? Who are you, who are you excited to see? Was there anyone that was left out maybe that you're – kind of thinking maybe they should have been included in this squad. I'm sorry, who are we even playing in this window? That's a very, very good question. Um, I'll hopefully get Josh Parrish on the line very shortly to confirm. <laughs> but while I looked it up, tell me about the squad and who you like. Uh, no, look, I think Australia will be fine. Um, at the moment, uh, we are easing through qualifying. Uh, we've got this Lebanon double where we Lebanon, play right. them at home and then they play us at home in Canberra. I don't think that's good by the FA, you know. Another game in Southeast Asia, another game in Qatar, another game, you know, yes, it might have been a bit easier for our European-based players because they're already halfway home, but I actually mm. feel as though this was a, a good political move, do the right thing. Uh, you know, I mean, it's interesting we've got both Lebanon and Palestine in this group. So I think for once we're actually getting to show that we are good AFC citizens, and it's one of those things that really gets people worked up you know, the AFC full of, you know, nations that maybe don't do the right thing by us. Think of, you know, Hakeem Al-Arabi and, and Bahrain you know, as the primary example. But whenever Australia does something that shows that we're not the good AFC citizen, everyone has a massive blow up. So it's nice that we get mm. to do this. I mean, obviously, we'll win both games. Um, I just I just <laughs> hope it's, it's not seen as yet another siege mentality proving the doubt is wrong because it does become exhausting. I mean, if anything, now is probably the time for Arnie to really get back on the home of football mm. government funding train just because, you know, a lot of politicians do consume Sky News and News Corp and they may have been reading uh, stories about a, a certain high-profile Australian football figure, um, you know, uh, misbehaving overseas. So I think Arnie needs to to grab back the narrative and start his lobbying again because we certainly won't be talking about the actual football we play. So. Well, absolutely. I mean, you say that though, but Lebanon, are, what they're in second at the moment, four points behind. So if there is a, a slip up in the first leg of the, um, the infamous Lebanon double, there will, there there will is... not be a slip up. There will, hey, I, I'm just I, 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 I absolutely give you a maths guarantee for whatever that may be worth. <laughs> a a maths guarantee that Australia will win both games. And I would even go as far as to say we will keep a clean sheet in both games. Hopefully a Lebanese food truck at the next Brisbane home game as well. What do you think about Nisbet? Do you reckon he's this is his chance to really, uh, you know, stick his claim and and solidify his place in the squad? Well, but the thing is, though, he has been called in and it's a good call up that I think a lot of people, you know, from the, the sentiment of it agree with. But he was called up mm. for a defender. So it's not yeah. like he actually has displaced anyone in the hierarchy that is there to begin with. Now, to actually answer your question seriously... I don't think Yazbek should should be in, in this squad. I don't think Fawn Rowley should be in this squad. I definitely think John Iredale shouldn't be in this squad. It seems like a very imbalanced team. A lot of people were also targeting Brandon Barello as someone that maybe his A-League form didn't really merit a call-up. Um, mm. it, it does seem as though we've picked a midfield to be bypassed a little bit, uh, which should come as a surprise to no one. Um, <laughs> but at least it's good. At least it's good to see Iden Hristic in there. Uh, and, and he's back. Hopefully he actually, you know, starts getting regular football. But again, I don't think the various quibbles and problems we have with the Australian team uh, apply to this round of qualifying. Let's not forget, in the previous cycle for 2022, this is where we were in the midst of the Socceroos play like Liverpool, best Socceroos ever, record 11 win streak in a row. 
So this mm. is this is the time to make hay while the sun shines, and you know it, the the results take care of themselves. Great to see Rustich back. I mean, you talk about a midfield that might be walked through. But he, you know, when fit, went back to full full fitness. He brings a lot of stability there with Irvine, brings a lot of cover and also a lot of attacking threat. So I mean, hopefully we get to see him play. Um, I'm not sure if he's fit enough to to start. And another actual serious point is like Gethin Jones is there, and when Josh Rawlins came back from mm. Utrecht, uh, we flagged. We were actually trying to work out which right backs we have that could potentially, That's right. you know, play in that position into the future. But I am quite concerned that uh, Rawlins' own form means. Right now, that's creating a headache for the Oli Roos, never mind for a potential Socceroos call up in the future. So, Gethin Jones, I don't know, all the Bolton fans, we're kind of, we're kind of stuck with them. I don't really like that they've <laughs> adopted Australia as a nation to barrack against. It, 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 is, you know, it is, if there's one thing the Australian game needs less of, it's arrogant English people telling us that our backwater on the other side of the world doesn't know anything about football. I think we've kind of filled our quota of that and, and we, we kind of don't need any more of it. We're kind of done here. It's one of the more unusual rivalries in football is the nation of Australia versus the Bolton Wanderers fans. I mean, I hope to see a few of them donning some Lebanese uh, jerseys over, yeah. the, over the next couple of weeks. Maybe they'll pick up a new team. Um, keep your comments coming in. And I know Josh and Nick aren't here, but we've got a record number of uh, people tuning in. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Record numbers last week. We're keeping it up this week. So thank you for all your comments. We had a question about Ange this week, Tao. Now, if we didn't see it, Ange was asked a question about plastic fans in the stadium. I don't really yeah. love the, the term plastic. On, yeah, on, anyway. the, on the topic of on the very topic of arrogant English uh, English Absolutely. people think that their accent gives them uh, you know some sort of precedence over all aspects of football and that you know English English Premier League perfectly happy to take the money of international mm. rights that makes it the international powerhouse that it is and the richest league in the world. But then as soon as the very people whose eyeballs contribute that record amount of money start to have a buy-in in opinions, well, that's a big problem. So yeah. It doesn't make much sense for, for quite a few reasons. Now, I want to know what the journalist is thinking asking Ange this question as well. Someone who grew up in Australia, has travelled overseas, has worked overseas, has now come to, to come to England to work. But you've seen a few journalists over the, the past six months Ask Ange questions where he's just batted them straight back. There have been silly questions. It started off with a Harry Kane jersey from a from a German journalist coming in with a Bayern Kane top. It's not going to end well. So, to, to be fair, to, to be fair to the German journalist, based on what has happened since, that guy is starting to look like high art. Like yeah, he really he, is, he actually might be he actually might be following. Right. Yeah, well, he might be following Shane Gillis as the next uh, stand-up host of Saturday Night Live, the way things are going, <laughs> compared to all the other gimmicks the Chernos have pulled over there since. Well, I think Andrew's response to this, and the question was, what do you think of all these plastic fans coming into the stadium? Now, there's a lot of South Korean fans at Tottenham Games, mainly because of Hyung Min Son, the captain there. You see a lot of them in the crowd. You see a lot of foreigners coming in. There's a lot of tourists, but... I don't understand the problem here. It's a ticket, it's a ticket. And for people like us in Australia, if I had the chance to go over and watch Tottenham, absolutely, I'm spending a lot of money to get a seat there. Why would you ask Ange this question? And I think he answered it perfectly. He kind of shut him down straight away. But what did you think of it, Teo? Well, are we sure that the same people who were behind um, the Auckland jersey getting onto the pitch weren't behind this question? Like, or, almost to the point where Ange, like, you know, yeah, if Ange was wanting, I don't, I don't think he needs to do this. I think people ask these stupid questions purely off their own volition. But can you imagine if, as a bit of a quid pro quo, he says to certain journos, "I'll give you, you know, this information about an injury or about how I might set up tactically against this opponent." but you have to ask me this particular question in a press conference and then just keep your poker face on when I absolutely rip you a new one, not my answer. I, that, you know, a, a lot of referees have come out and talked about, you know, um, the influence of Sir Alex Ferguson on them, both uh, implied and also like literal and how it would affect both consciously and subconsciously their decision-making. Are we sure Ange isn't Jedi mind-tricking these journos? Mm. Into, you know, the journos almost thinking, I can ask a smart question, which gets a smart answer, and my tweet will get two likes and no retweets, yeah. and it will come and go, and no one will pay it a moment's attention, and I won't get anything out of it. Um, just to, how I tend to run my Twitter, just a lot of nice, vanilla, honest stuff that doesn't try to you know fool or mislead people. Or 
I can ask a silly question, which he hits me for six on, but at least that will go around the world. I do start to wonder if journalists are actually putting their heads into the bear trap in order to get them chopped off because they know that's the way they can make a name for themselves. It's an interesting way to live, Taylor. And look, I know you wouldn't do it yourself, as you described. Like, yeah, I've, I've seen your Twitter. Too account. boring. I'm too boring. There's there's a reason that <laughs> you and there's a reason you and me are hosting this podcast in the absence of Stoll and Parish. It's because you know they're the born entertainers. I'm sorry. Hey, listen, we've been doing a really good job here. We saw the new, uh, we saw the new audio. We saw the new background on maths. It's a really, it's, it's a game changer. <laughs> not, they might not walk straight back in next week, but. Let's get on to Andrew's football because it wasn't a great game for Tottenham. It was there. It was a 3 0 defeat to Fulham away, a game they probably should be winning. Fulham are a tricky team, but I spoke about this, I think, last week or the week before on the podcast. Ange Ball hasn't looked the same as the start of the year since maybe January, February this year. They've had a lot of tricky games and they're not playing the free flowing football that kind of Ange, when he, when he came into the team last year, it was attacking. It was a you know, really attacking. It was open play. It's been a little bit, I want to say a little bit cagey. And I don't know whether it's because the opponents like Fuller are a little bit more organized. Aston Villa last week, different story. They play a high line and they had a man sent off. But I think when Ange is coming up against these more stubborn teams, Teo, he comes into a little bit more trouble. And and unfortunately this week, they had their 39 game run of scoring a goal in every single game. And this week it came to an end and they just couldn't get get away back in really. I mean, to be fair, Villa continue to hit the skids themselves. Like they drew with West Ham mm. and potentially should have even lost, which would have given Spurs the opportunity. I mean, Spurs can win their game in hand and overtake them uh, on goals scored if they win by two anyway. Amazing to think that if Spurs win their next game 1-0, then Villa and Tottenham will have perfectly identical records, goals for and goals against, including win, draw, loss. So even the A-League tiebreaker of, of doing it by wins uh, wouldn't have been enough. It is interesting. But the, the thing is here, with fifth place looking like it's going to England and Spurs maybe even claiming that fourth place anyway, Andrew's football works perfectly for the Champions League. These are the teams that they want to come up against, I think, even though it might be a higher, higher quality than a team like Fulham. But they want to attack. They play that higher line. They, they play in a different style that, Tottenham have had success even, you know, the second or third game in against Manchester United, Arsenal. They've drawn at City. They're playing against these teams and they're actually hitting them. So I think if they do make the Champions League next year, look out because I reckon they could go a very long way. Well, can can I say, though, that, like, would you consider right now the concern to be Villa or Man United? Because the emotional lift that – I know Manchester United have had a lot of false dawns. Think back to when they had that 3-2 comeback win against uh, Villa when Rasmus Hoyland – uh, mm. finally scored his first goal and, and the Australian music industry celebrated because uh, was it Sean, uh, what was his name? Oh, the, the singer from Australia. Sean, Sean Mendes. Mendes. I don't think it was Mendes. Mendes. Um, but but uh, we had, um, we, we had uh, sort of that, um, you know, false dawn for Manchester United then. I'm wondering if winning through to the FA Cup semi-final in a similar fashion might be the sort of thing that peps them up just a bit. They are six points and, crucially, 17 goals difference behind Spurs at the moment. But they've still got 10 games mm. to go, which is quite a lot. So I just wonder, like, you're the Spurs fan here. Um, I'm just looking at the fixture to see. Man United have still got Liverpool at home, which will be a pretty tough game. They've still got Chelsea away which will be a tough game as well. Uh, but do you think that the bigger threat to fourth spot is Villa or Man United? No, I think it's Villa. I think even though Villa are shaky, Man- Manchester United are equally unpredictable and shaky. So I, I don't I don't trust them to kind of come away with any wins in games. But the, the tricky thing about this run is, I think off the top of my head, Spurs have uh, Liverpool, Manchester City and Newcastle and Arsenal all in the month of May, which... It looks like a very, very difficult fixture run. But as I've just said, like these teams that play a bit of a different game style, play more attacking Spurs actually do well against. So I think Villa is the main threat to them. I don't see Manchester United making up the ground, but I think Spurs will go all the way. What do you think? Are you, do you trust Manchester United when they're playing? Uh, well, I mean, as an Arsenal fan, <laughs> um, I, mm. I have had to, I have had to hold my nose and want the best for Ange for most of the season. And to be honest, I wouldn't hate it if they end up in fourth, mainly because it will do more net positives for all Australians in football 
than um than it will if he finishes fifth or sixth. Um, to finish fourth in the season, they sell Harry Kane with the media riding him all the way through. Um, you know, uh, I I believe it would be the the uh, tide that lifts all boats for the Australian game if Ange can finish fourth. Now, speaking of which, uh, m- speaking of plastics as well, it's a it's a neat little segue here. Uh, a lot of blow up on social media today because the Victorian government is set to use the mighty MCG, scene of Saturday's atrocity, um, to bring Tottenham Hotspur and Newcastle to Australia to play each other. And a lot of Australian fans were saying, we've kind of had enough of these friendlies. Whatever happened to the A-League All-Stars? Joe, you are based in Melbourne. Will you be forking out a big, big sum for Tottenham versus Newcastle at some point in the next couple of months? How big are we talking? What's big? I mean, big me might be different to big you, Tay, up there in Sydney, so I'm not so sure. Okay, okay. Um, uh, big me would be, do I have accreditation? Uh, and then too big would be, <laughs> do I have to pay? Um, yes. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so it, if it was if it was Arsenal playing at Newcastle or Spurs here in Sydney, I probably would go. Mm. I, I wouldn't fly or drive into state for it, but I don't know. Let's say tickets start from $150, and, $150. and that gets you potentially uh, – I mean, potentially nosebleeds at the MCG. I probably would, begrudgingly. I think I was just talking earlier about if I had the opportunity to go to England, I'd go to watch a Spurs game. It'll be a lot more than that. So I think even though it is a uh, a friendly fixture and not against the A-League All-Stars, I think I would probably pay it. And I think they can sell 100,000 tickets. I think why not? Would you go? A a A lot of the cynics, of course, are saying this is, you know, 72 hours after that both teams will play their final Premier League mm. match of the season, like literally like Barcelona when they played the A-League All-Stars two, two years ago, they will play their final Premier League match. And almost like they've got another away game, they will just go straight to Australia. Players that go to the Euros probably won't come. So, you know, Toros here saying Spurs versus Newcastle reserves. But yeah. but that experience is still, you know, when when's the last time Newcastle came to Australia? Probably in the NSL era, I'm guessing. Yeah, um, And Spurs last came here in I think 2016 for the Champions Trophy when they played played Juventus I think I thought they played Roma and Manchester City I could be mistaken I might be thinking of I I know they came out here I think 2015 and 2016 Mm. and Spurs came 2016 we had Real Madrid Man City and Roma one year and then I think Spurs yeah you're right might have um, played against Atletico Madrid the year after yeah but look it's it's good opportunity. I mean, we saw the when Liverpool came it was a little while ago now, but one hundred thousand people at the MCG that went global. How how good that looked and how many people were were singing. I don't think Newcastle fans will be will be singing as loud, but as an exhibition game. Now let's talk about the A League All Stars. Now, would you would you spend the one hundred and fifty dollars if it was Tottenham against the A League All Stars instead of Newcastle? I mean, again, as an Arsenal fan, almost. I mean, almost certainly not. It probably depends who's in the. <laughs> It depends who's in the A-League All-Stars. I know that, uh, again, a lot of people have been asking, where are the A-League All-Stars? Why aren't they a part of this? I feel as though the Victorian government are kind of sneaky dogs when, and I I can say this as someone who fled uh, during COVID. Um, (laughs) Don't judge me too harshly. Um, Sneaky dogs that kind of, they went for Brazil versus Argentina, but when they had to cancel like Brazil versus Argentina said, oh, We'll make it up to the Victorian people. It's like, how about having a word to Victoria Police and how they behave at Melbourne Victory Games? That is how you make it up to the Victorian people. Absolutely. You don't do it by booking Spurs versus Newcastle at the MCG. But they've got this, this kind of big event mentality, and they seem to have brushed the A-League, even though it's ours. You know, the Victorian government is actually committing cultural cringe as we speak. You know, they're willing to underwrite netball, but they don't want a bar of local football. I don't get it. So it's kind of frustrating in that respect. And I mean, A-League Women's All-Stars, that rumor about them playing Arsenal never really went away. Um, And the way Arsenal are going at the moment, I think the A-League Women's All-Stars would beat Arsenal because I don't know if you saw the WSL at the weekend, Joe, but uh, Emma Hayes was in the doghouse for a few things she said in the media, which weren't very mathsy, so we won't get into them. Um, she had half her team out injured, including Sam Kerr, and still just destroyed Arsenal 3-1 mm. um, and and appears to have blown the WSL title wide open while ending Arsenal's season in the process. So I think bring them out here now because their brand is strong. They get huge crowds, but they are a very, very beatable team. 
they're vulnerable. I, that would now. Do you think that would sell out the MCG with the way that women's? No, football? not even close. But it, you it, don't it think might, it would? No, it might get twenty thousand though. <laughs> I mean, I, I would have thought Amy Park would be a more appropriate venue mm. if that was to be played as a standalone game. And, and I mean, I think the other factor is, you know, we've got Caitlin Ford and Steph Catley and Kyra Cooney Cross on the Arsenal team. I think if you sold a category of ticket where, like, you're in the first two rows, but all the way around the stadium. And it allows you to bring in the most beggiest, desperate sign that you want. Give me your boots. Give me your jersey. Give me your bank account number. And you can bring give in me your as, lunch money. If you if you if you sold a category of ticket, and it was like this is the cringe free zone. We will not judge you for what you put on the sign. I actually think that ticket would be a bestseller because there are lots of people out there who try to demonize these poor kids. But I say, if that's what brings you through the gates, if that's your motivation to go, I'm not going to judge you, but maybe I'm going to charge you a little bit extra and make some money off you. I think it's a great idea. And also it's a great opportunity for a photo as we saw on the weekend with Courtney Vine, her interaction with the Knicks fans. Now this actually came through on Twitter Roscoe mentioned he, uh, Courtney Vine's interaction with Knicks fan at yesterday's A-League women match in New Zealand. Good banter and in good nature. We've got the photo here. Now, what did you think of this? Because they were giving it to Courtney all game, all game. And then she's good enough to come up and take a photo. It was quite mathsy. I loved it. Um, I am, look, Courtney Vine is a very good sport. And she also celebrated in their face in a tasteful way, not in an antagonistic way, when uh, the fourth goal went in. Mm. Look, there's a lot of smiling faces from those Wellington fans there. So I say bravo, Courtney Vine. Uh, and you know what? Fair play to those Knicks fans. Uh, again, you know, this league, the A-League Women's, is still kind of finding its feet. You know, we know it's a, a great family-friendly league. We know it's great for kids. And I think adults and, like, football supporters who want to – you know, be colourful and noisy and barrack for their team. They are still finding their way in this league for what is fair game and, and what is crossing the line. And so to see something like this, I think that's a perfect balance. And uh, I think we can trust that, um, you know, the Knicks fans, uh, look, I've had them in my DMs in the past complaining about what I've said about them. But, uh, you know, like my fellow redhead Courtney Vine, I just brushed it off, mate. Absolutely. You gave it back too, just like Courtney Vine. <laughs> <Not quite. laughs> now uh, now what i noticed about this photo is there's a man wearing an angry birds what would you call it a hat is it a bee oh, is that angry birds okay i thought it's he was angry, just a chicken, angry birds. i thought he was a chicken farmer it could, could be it could also be a chicken farmer by trade but that's definitely an angry birds hat is, is the person next to him definitely wearing wellington colors or is that a richmond tigers hat it yeah, genuinely that looks... That, that looks like a <laughs> that looks like a tigers logo to me i want to know that person's thoughts on adam Uze. Absolutely. And the umpiring decisions on the weekend. But <laughs> this is what I love about this photo. There's a lot going on. There's a truck in the background. I don't know if that's another food truck from Brisbane. They're all trying to work it out. Courtney's giving it back. It's a lot of fun. It's very mathsy. Good on Courtney. And look, Taylor, we had a lot of comments come through over the week. Were there any that really caught your eye? Uh, are we talking about uh, the tweets that we got to the show? Absolutely. Uh, all right. Um, Have a you look know what? if I put you on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, we had we had a bit of discussion uh, about what's going on in Queensland, and you mentioned the the venue earlier. I mean, mm. Josh here, um, uh, as we lose the photo of Courtney Vine, Joe. Um, <laughs> We're all still learning here. Yeah, <laughs> it's our first. It, it she's back. It's our first day. Um, Josh just said, "I don't know. I just think we should bring back the North Queensland Fury." Now, wow. did you did you own a Fury kit, or was it just a Wellington kit that you owned in your? No, I own a Wellington kit, not, not a Fury kit. They went around for long enough for me to purchase one, but I wish I did. Did you have one? No, no, of course not. Um, I I do <laughs> remember going to watch them play when that season Robbie Fowler was playing for them. I mean, uh, and yes. when they're the away team, I do feel like they were just another team. I, I feel as though a lot of their identity was caught up in uh you know playing where they did the france striker era uh one of isaka cernak's many stops uh, among his nine clubs that he played for but um, <laughs> i don't know maybe there's a time when they will come back to the a-league but i do feel as though tazzy 
is now starting to move, and, and Christchurch are now starting to move further and further up the pecking order. I mean, Tassie, I mean, they've already got the uh, the AFL team now. What do you think, though, the Tassie team in the A-League in the next 20 years, is that is that on the cards? Well, I mean, I know they won't win a lot sooner, but there's been a big blow-up about how mm. the Federation in Tasmania is supporting the, uh, the Tasmania A-League bid, which has really a little more than a, a cloud of smoke, but is not going to be supporting South Hobart bidding for the National Second Division. And, and that is causing some consternation down there. So I think that, uh, yeah, there's still a few political things that need to be resolved. Um, actually, there is something I want mm. to finish with. We didn't get any questions about Please. it, but I, Joe, you may have missed this. Uh, you live in, in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, yeah? I do, absolutely. So if you were to take the one hour's drive down to Tarnit, uh, okay. on on Sunday to go and watch Melbourne uh, Western United's first ever game at the training venue. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a bit of an effort on your part, a bit of effort on everyone's part, frankly, given where the team is based, and also the good faith that they may potentially have exhausted uh, having promised to build a stadium upon their entry to the A-League and having taken five years to build a training venue instead. Yep. How much do you think you would reasonably expect to pay for parking uh, upon your arrival Ooh. at Estadio de Tarnit, based in literally the middle of nowhere with nothing but empty paddocks and a construction site surrounding the stadium. Now, this is interesting because I assume street parking is not an option. I don't think there's any secure parks There are no around. streets. There are, there's no street parking <laughs> because there's no streets. I'm going to say $8 and not a cent more. Right. Well, uh, if you had perhaps doubled that and then added four, you would have found the amount that was being charged for parking. Um, Now, I don't think that's fun. Like the goal of this podcast is Mm. the Make Australian Football Fun Society. What was fun in Australian football this week? What would make it more fun next week? You know what would make it more fun? Not gouging the poor bastards that have shown faith in your club, your club which is late on delivery for literally everything, how could you do that to them? Of all the people, you know, the, like only the true believers, the last ones standing who are still flying the flag for this club would have gone and you decide to sting them for 20 bucks to park in an empty field. I mean, yeah. I, you know, let's make a – come on, Western United, let's make Australian football fun. Parking should be free. And, I mean, do you really think that, you know, paying that 20 bucks just to get out of your car, do you think that came with security for your car? Do you think if someone came and hot wired or broke your windows, there'd be security guards running up to protect it like in a Wilson parking lot where, you know, you might be paying that sort of money to park in inner city Sydney? Of course not. Mm. It's good on you for raising this. And I think the way to make it more fun, we have a shuttle. We have a free shuttle from oh, no, the northern that, suburbs like myself. Oh, well, from the northern suburbs. Mate, the, yep, the shuttle absolutely. from the nearest... The shuttle from the nearest train station was already working hard enough, mate. I think, you know what we could do? We could grab the master dumpling truck from the Brisbane ground, bring it down, everyone pop in the back, maybe, you know, try a hand making the dumplings and we go down together. Then 20 bucks between 30 people, not so bad. But yeah, I'm with you. You can't be charging that amount of money. How much was the ticket to get in? Uh, less than parking. I do think it's yeah. only $10 to get into the A-League women's. So you, pay, you paid, and that, to be fair, it was ten dollars for members, and I also think it was ten dollars for people who carpooled four cars or more. But if if that and the perhaps the sneakiest Lewis says he wouldn't have paid more than tree fifty. Well, if you want the yeah. Loch Ness monster, that's the amount you pay. <laughs> um, I I do believe they had a, a page about on their website about how to get to the ground, and it said details about parking will be communicated at a later date. And that later date was on match day as the tweet started rolling in saying, oh, my God, it's 20 bucks. And then the, the web page actually updated and said, oh, by the way, parking is 20 bucks. Yeah. yeah. Tickets, five bu- tickets, 10 bucks. Parking, 20. <laughs> so That's I say do it. we need to you know, take a page out of the, uh, the Central Coast Mariners book. You know, you don't get charged for parking at a regatta, and, and that is what the Central Coast Mariners were holding at the weekend. Uh, Western <laughs> Western United have got – they want to play three men's games there before the yep. season's out. And, look, it, it did look good on TV. I thought that the surface played pretty well, and the actual match, you know, was good entertainment. Newcastle yeah. had a win. But, you yeah, know, the pitch played fine, and I haven't heard a single negative thing uh, from any of the players or even the media that went to the game. But – Come on, we need to get some goodwill back 
and a bit of maths is the way to do it. Absolutely. A bit of maths goes a long way. And thank you, all of you, for tuning in today, all your comments on Twitter and on YouTube. Teo, before I let you go, I mean, it's, a, it's only a 55-minute show today. It's an espresso edition compared to what we usually do. But any final comments from you? I mean, Easter Monday is mm. is kind of, you know, if we can't beat Essendon, then Easter Monday has to be the top priority. The Swans are actually good this year, so yeah. I don't think we're going to be able to beat the Swans. We've got the Ds next. The Ds are playing well, and uh, they've had our number for a number of years, so I'm not optimistic about that whatsoever. Um, look, I, I'm realistic about Hawthorne. I had us, well, not really. I had us coming, coming 10th this year. Might need mm. to just... Uh, readjust that down to about 14th, <laughs> maybe lower. But Easter Monday, for God's sake, I just want to beat Geelong. I just want to Absolutely. beat Geelong. Yeah. Hey, I, can't think beat might... I, I, I will cop a 2 and 21 season or even, a, you know, like a 3 and 19 season. But if one of those wins can be against Geelong, I might actually be happy. Look, I think Essendon kind of – all of them were the better team on the weekend. They kicked themselves out of the game. No, and no, also, but, I yeah, see... no, because bad kicking is bad footy, though. You know, Sa- Sam true. Mitchell – Sam Mitchell wouldn't want this to be the weekly Hawthorne experience, you know. Leaders playing poorly, bad kicking for goal, youngsters stalling. I mean, he's not he's not the warmest figure, Sam Mitchell, to the media. And I feel as though the media have got their claws into Bevo. You know, Simon Goodwin is maybe evading, evading their grasp for now. Same for Justin Longmuir. But the heat will be coming for Adam Simpson. And, of course, Clarko is only ever one press conference away from his next gaffe. But... Once the media has, has kind of had their, their fill, um, then they'll be coming for, for Sam Mitchell, and, and then I'm concerned. The real concern is Harley Reid at West Coast and what he's going to do to lift that team up the table above Hawthorne. We hope not. But also, the parking on the weekend, Hawthorne-Melbourne, huge game, probably at, you know 70000 there, less than in Tarnit. I think it's only about 12 <laughs> bucks at Yarra Park, and you can walk right in. <laughs> um, one, one last thing, uh, Joe, uh, mm. as we want, we'll, we'll get this down before the hour mark, everyone. Don't worry. <laughs> Tora says, are you still talking about sport? Um, have you seen the film? It's a Netflix exclusive, The Platform. I have not. Okay. So uh, people who have seen it will know what I'm talking about. Basically, it's one of those sort of uh, conceptual films like Cube or, or Saw, you know, trapped in a confined area sort of film. Basically, two prisoners wake up um, – on a, on a platform in a building and it's got a number on the wall and each okay. day they wake up on a different number and no one knows how many platforms there are, but they only get fed once a day and it's fed. So there's a big sort of cavern in the middle that goes okay. all the way down to the bottom and a platform lowers each level. And if you're on platform one, you get all the food you want. And if you're on platform five, half of it's been eaten. And if you're on platform 80, you starve, right? Okay, sure. And and I just think that the AFL coaching sack race is very similar to the movie platform. And right now, Sam Mitchell is up on number one. He still gets to eat. He's and feasting. Luke Beveridge, Luke Beveridge is down on platform 100. He's starving. And I just get the feeling that at some point, Sam Mitchell is going to wake up this season and he is going to be on level 100 and he is going to be in big, big trouble. Mm, he's going to be in trouble. Daniel on YouTube says, make Hawthorne fun again. We're trying our best. We certainly are. I think with the AFL this year as well, Teo. Now, Hawthorne, <laughs> if I... <laughs> I just saw a comment come through saying, are you still talking about sport? We're getting there. <laughs> Don't you worry. Now, Hawthorne, yeah. they brought back Jack Gunston. Now, a very feel-good story. Back after just one year at Brisbane. His inaccuracy on the weekend. Does he does he keep his place in the do side you think? Do you think I ever forgave Jack Gunston for the 2012 mm. Grand Final? He's my least favourite triple premiership player. And there's a few of them as well. Look, we should probably... Oh, no, we've got one more comment from Joseph coming through. Socceroos and Collingwood bypassing the midfield Do you think, recently. Absolutely. Think we've done enough to make sure that Stoll and Josh don't skip an episode at the same time in the future? No, I don't think so. They really couldn't keep us under control, could they? Um, but it's been a pleasure chatting to you, Teo. It's been, a, it's been a very fun 59 minutes and eight seconds. We've covered everything here. Uh, any final comments before we leave? Uh, just uh, let me queue up the uh, the exit video before we say goodbye. Uh, and uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, rate us five stars, uh, post it on Reddit. Make sure to be as obnoxious as possible when you post it on Reddit just to wind everyone up. It seems as though that um, 
you know, again, a bit like my Twitter, doing something honestly gets you nowhere. Doing something in an antagonistic fashion gets a massive amount of interaction. Absolutely. So if you are going to post a, a link to maths on Reddit, do it in a really obnoxious way that gets as many replies as possible, or just put factual errors in the yep. post. You know, say that um, you know these guys talked about the upcoming games against Palestine, um, and people go, no, Lebanon, Lebanon, and then that'll massively signal boost the post because you've deliberately put an error in. So, you know, thanks and success. Yeah, Nick Stoll and Josh Parrish both missing today due to a fist fight after last week. I mean, who knows if it's true? It doesn't really matter at this stage. We just want the numbers. So it's been a pleasure talking to you, Teo. Uh, hopefully you've got that button ready. Let us know in the comments how we went hosting today. It's our first day, but we always try our best. <laughs> Thank you for always for watching and thanks and success.